Welcome to BioCentury This Week. I'm Jeff Cranmer, Executive Editor of BioCentury, and today we continue with the second of our podcast series on Back to School. The 2021 BioCentury Back to School project lays the groundwork for the case that expedited approvals are poised for change and analyzes the forces that could stretch the vision of expedited approvals. They have been a big success in cancer, but in the past decade, little elsewhere. The stretch vision of expedited approval would bring more drugs to more patients in more diseases around the world. Today, we're going to focus on the first part of the pathway, gaining approval. Joining me to discuss day two of Back to School are... Simon Fishburn, Editor-in-Chief. Selena Koch, Executive Editor. And Karen Koch tesman Senior Editor. Simone, welcome back to the pod. What are the opportunities and challenges in this part of the expedited approval journey? Thanks, Jeff. So we've looked at this from the angle that accelerated and conditional approval pathways should actually be a springboard for innovation. And in the stretch vision, that would mean you need to create many novel surrogate endpoints to enable the use of the pathways in more indications and more diseases. Now, the problem is, in particular in the US, that with surrogate endpoints, you have something called the reasonably likely standard. So the way the law is written, FDA can grant accelerated approval if a surrogate or interim endpoint is reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit. The problem is that there's no real standard for what reasonably likely means. Companies complain that there are differences between divisions in the agency, that there aren't uniform standards. And effectively, FDA does what it wants here. They take the view that the Supreme Court does with pornography and they say, I'll know it when I see it. Okay, and so that is their view of accelerated approval. And that really creates a lot of problems for inconsistencies. Selena, we've written a little bit about how we think FDA and other agencies could go about this. Maybe you can expand on that. Right. Well, a standard that's so undefined that it can be applied any which way is, isn't really a standard, right? So I think the goal has to be a rational standard that's reliable and applied routinely. Obviously, it can be different standards for different diseases or mechanisms of action. But if you're going with reasonably likely as your standard, one could put a number behind that and say, well, we think reasonably likely to predict clinical benefit is a 70% chance or a 90% chance or a 60% chance, whatever that number is. At least then it gives you a target to aim for, and it would have implications for how many of these programs you can expect to convert to a full approval and how many might end up withdrawn because they don't pan out in the end, because this is a calculated guess regulators are taking and some things aren't going to pan out, right? And so setting out ahead of time, what is our risk level? How much risk are we willing to take on gives you then some way to know if the pathway is working as intended or if some sort of a course correction ought to be triggered. There is certainly a need to balance flexibility, which innovators agree is a good thing, with consistency. You can't just be inconsistent all over the place. Selena, we've talked a little bit about a framework. I know you've got some examples or an example of what that might look like. Yeah, well, it could break down by disease area. That's one way you could think about different levels of flexibility for different diseases, or it could be mechanisms of action. But for instance, in oncology, one type of flexibility that often gets deployed is when you're looking at response rate, which is far and away the most widely used surrogate for cancer cancer drugs, which is objective response rate. And you like them to be north of 30% or so, but FDA does approve lower ORRs. And when it does that, it takes other factors into consideration, such as how long do the responses last? So if they're very fleeting and the response rate is low, it might not get approval. Whereas if it's the response rate is low, but these these responses really do stick around for a while, then it might warrant approval. So other diseases might have their own sort of parameters that need to be taken into consideration. Sort of trade-offs in a way as well. Correct. 
Yeah, I agree with that. And I, I personally don't think you have regulators sitting there saying, I'm going to rule this way because I need to make my metric. I acknowledge that there are some issues with creating the sort of framework that Selena's outlined, but certainly there has to be an attempt in that direction. And what we also see, which we discuss in the package, is how some other regulatory agencies are approaching this. One thing I want to bring in is Karen, because at this point, it's not like nobody's coming out with new surrogate endpoints. There are a few, very few, I would say, in the near term, certainly not the number that we need for the stretch vision. But let's talk for a few minutes about what's on the short term horizon, Karen. Sure. Well, it's pretty interesting because when we've spoken with people in the past, it seems like it took over 30 years to get agreement around surrogate endpoints like ALT for liver injury. Talking to people now, that has definitely changed. I've seen comments from, for example, folks from EMA saying companies are more involved in this, regulators are more involved in this, nonprofits are more involved in this. And so there is more momentum and activity around the quest for surrogate endpoints, and that is bearing some fruits. But when you look at what's the state of the art? What are some surrogate endpoints that are poised for use or have been very recently applied? The theme that you see is that you have basically lots of academics and companies, consortia, zooming in on some metric that is already typically part of standard clinical practice, which is why there's a lot of evidence behind it. It's something that doctors have been measuring and maybe making decisions on for years or decades. But then the task at hand is to formally decide that it is predictive enough of outcomes based on epidemiology and then interventional trials to say, yes, we think this should be a surrogate endpoint. And the bar is pretty high and the microscope is pretty focused on things that are already part of day-to-day clinical practice. And what are a couple of those things? Well, there are actually two that we highlight that are outside of cancer. One could be the basis of an approval any day now. That is proteinuria for IgAN or IgAN nephropathy. It's a particular form of kidney disease. And that's something where Caliditas has a PDUFA date coming up in September. In addition to work done by the company and academics around this endpoint, FDA has dug in and done its own work, suggesting that this could be predictive of clinical efficacy. And so that's on the docket. Another one, which is a bit more controversial, I think, is NT-ProBNP for heart failure. And this is something where FDA has used it as a surrogate for approving a pediatric label extension for Entresto. And there are good reasons to think people believe that it's an endpoint that's really applicable to the mechanism of action of Entresto. What's more controversial, I think, is how broadly it applies to different mechanisms of heart failure. And then within cancer, one form of a surrogate endpoint that's had a lot of momentum is measurable residual disease, MRD. And a particular form of that that's moving forward now is applying it to AML, where it hasn't been applied historically, looking at a specific mutation. And Kronos is a company that's on the forefront of that. When it comes to the heart failure one, some folks had told you that biomarker was very closely tied to Entresto's mechanism of action, which is what made it a natural surrogate, but that for other cardiovascular candidates, it's not as closely tied. And so they call into question whether it would be a good surrogate. There's kind of two ways of looking about that though, right? I mean, a good surrogate, I mean, it it needs to predict clinical benefits. So it could just be something that does that, that has functional consequences regardless of how closely tied it is to a particular drug's mechanism or not. On the other hand, if we move towards molecular mechanisms, say for genetic diseases and whatnot, where you're targeting primary disease drivers, in those cases, you really do want a surrogate that is that driver or is very closely, very close downstream of that driver. How do you look at the sort of tension between those two things? Well, I think the argument is that if you really want evidence that this drug is working, not just that the patient is overall doing more or less okay or not, which could maybe involve other factors about their background, et cetera, that you really want to hew closely to the drug's mechanism of action. 
But what was interesting is in the story, we highlight some data out of a group at Bayer that looked at a lot of real world evidence and a lot of clinical trials. And they make the case that it's predictive across a, a wide range of mechanisms of action. So it'll be interesting to see how real world data becomes more involved in teasing these things apart. Right. Although you, you could argue that as long as there's a big difference from the placebo group, how closely it's tied to the drug's mechanism may not matter so long as it, it does indeed predict clinical benefit. I could see it both ways. I'm curious what's on the long-term horizon here. Well, the longer view, I think we'll see the pace of surrogate endpoint development pick up from all this activity. And in particular, I think we'll see the industrialization of omics technologies bringing a lot richer data to the table on this and allowing exploration of potential surrogates that aren't currently under the microscope of what clinicians look at every day. So this is something where I spoke with companies that are developing technologies for a wide range of omics biomarkers, transcriptomics, metabolomics, proteomics, and ask them, where is the state of the science now, the state of the application, and what would it take to apply these things to surrogate endpoint development? And it was interesting to see one technology in particular that has a lot of momentum right now is spatially resolved transcriptomics. And a major breakthrough around that was because you can now do this on formal and preserved tissues that companies have going back for years. And so there's this bit of a time machine effect where people are able to look at results from studies where maybe they even know outcomes now and can look retrospectively and see in an unbiased fashion, what are some predictive markers that could then be further followed up on a surrogate. When you're looking at an omic scale, you have to be extra careful around your statistics because when you're looking at thousands of parameters and hundreds of patients, you can end up with some statistical issues that lead you down wrong alleys. And there's some attention paid to that in the story. We dig into that. It was just interesting to see the transcriptomic technologies are a bit further ahead in terms of application based on the success of NGS, of genomic sequencing. Genomics, of course, giving you more of a static picture of what a patient looks like based on their baseline characteristics. And uh, these other technologies giving you more of a phenotype, therapeutic responsive picture of what's going on. But mass spec-based technologies like metabolomics and proteomics are coming up there's more organization in terms of standardization of protocols, and people are looking into ways to reliably look at longitudinal data in those modalities. So it will be interesting to see what comes out as these become deployed for endpoints more regularly. It's really a very exciting scene that's unfolding. We have been watching and will continue to watch spatial transcriptomics and the different ways that that is going to deliver data and we really do think that adoption of these technologies is going to fuel biomarker discovery broadly. And that is actually, I'm going to set you up, Jeff, for tomorrow's because having these in place, once you get approval, you need to confirm approval using post-marketing studies. Thanks for that, Simone. That sets us up perfectly for tomorrow's back-to-school content and what we'll discuss on the pod we will be digging into that second part of the pathway, generating the confirmatory evidence. And then on Thursday, we'll talk about the third stage, modifying decisions after you get that evidence or don't get it. And then Friday, we'll be wrapping the package with our overarching essay, which ties this all together. All of the first two days of our 2021 BioCentury Back to School content can be found on our website, biocentury.com. We look forward to chatting more back to school tomorrow. All of BioCentury's podcasts are available on Spotify, Stitcher, Apple, and Google. Kendall Square Orchestra provides the music for our podcasts. The group connects science and technology professionals and other members of the greater Boston community to collaborate, innovate, and inspire through music while supporting causes related to healthcare and education. <laughs>